Welcome to Because the Beatles, a podcast about the Beatles, everything about the Beatles. From a next-gen perspective, I'm Erica. I'm Allison. And this is our first podcast. Yay! Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. We've been planning this for so long, and of course, Paul McCartney made us do it. I don't even know how long we've been talking about doing this podcast, but yeah, like Paul really kind of spurred us into action because there's some things that we need to address. Yeah, we need to talk about this. Make sure you follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. BC the Beatles is our handle everywhere. BC the Beatles. Exactly. And we have our website coming, which is a work in progress. But for now, you can find all of our episodes and like, you know, this is the first one, but there'll be more. You can find them on rebeatmag.com, R-E-B-E-A-T mag.com. Erica and I write things sometimes, so it's good. <laughs> Mostly about stuff like this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we've got, you know, lots of other stuff on Rebe. That's R-E-B-E-A-T. Last plug, I promise-ish. past couple of weeks has been crazy busy in Beatle world. There's been so much going on beyond Paul, which we'll talk about in a minute. One of the biggest things is the Beatles catalog is now entirely on YouTube. YouTube music is launching, which hopefully, I mean, we'll see where that goes, but obviously it's been on Spotify for a bit. It's on Apple music, but this is cool. This is like very accessible. And I think in YouTube where the world is so crazy with illegal videos, this is a really positive step for like just getting the music out there in a really legal way that can be shared. And yeah, it's awesome. It takes the place of all of those bootlegs that they pulled off. There were so many Beatles bootlegs on YouTube, maybe two years ago, and they took almost everything off. Yeah, they got really happy with the C and Ds on those for sure. Even one time I was looking for like, I am the walrus or something, and it was not on YouTube at all, period. And it's like, that's crazy. Thank God they finally did this. So very exciting. And then Let It Be is currently number 51 on the iTunes top downloaded songs. That's so crazy. And the one album is number 16 in top albums. And the blue album, the greatest hits 1967 to 70 is number 60 in iTunes downloads. That's so interesting to be like on downloads charts. I wonder what spurred that. Maybe Paul's resurgence and his new music, maybe that inspired people to buy that. I think it's a combination of that and something we'll talk about later, which is the fact that it's Let It Be. And that was in the James Corden carpool karaoke and was a very emotional moment. I wonder if people saw that and decided that they needed the song. That's a really good point. It's a really, really good point. And the Blue Album, that's so funny. Uh, Are you a Red Album or a Blue Album girl? I'm a Red Album girl because I thought they were kind of scary with all those beards when I was eight years old. (laughs) I, I, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. I think I'm probably the same. I'm a Red Album girl. But honestly, I'm going to be a real Beatle, like snob here and be like, I'm more of a past masters girl anyway. I'm okay with that. That's good. Yeah. I I like like past masters. That was a good one. Yeah. Those are good stuff. And speaking of Paul doing carpool karaoke in Liverpool, some really exciting news that there's going to be a new five story Beatles museum on Matthews street. And it's in a building. I looked up where the building was because I was curious. It's right beside the grapes pub, which if you've been to Liverpool, you've definitely been to the grapes, definitely gotten drunk there. Mm -hmm. I I definitely have. (laughs) Um, And, but there's right now there's a bar kind of like next door, like a couple doors up called, I think it's called Lennon bar. And it's always been super random and I've never gone in because I I think that's kind of dumb, but apparently the museum is going to go in that building. Um, it's going to be ro- run by Rogue Best, who Rogue really helps out with the Casbah Museum in Liverpool, which was obviously run by his mother. And Rogue is the brother of Pete, goes without saying. But one thing that I always forget about Rogue, Rogue is also the son of Neil Aspinall. So he's collected all this memorabilia. And he, I mean, some of the things that he's saying are going to be in this museum are like John Sargent Pepper medals, which is cool. And some guitars and uh, a lot of great stuff that we probably haven't seen before, which is awesome. I mean, the Beatles already have, you know, the Beatles story in Liverpool, which is an amazing museum, highly recommend. Um, but this is going to be great. It's going to be right in the heart of it. Uh, I'm really excited. I can't wait to go see it. It's going to be open later this month, by the way, uh, July 20th. I'm very excited too. I really think that I need to get to Liverpool just to see this. Let's go. Let's go now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, let's go after July 20th. Yeah, be let's not go now. <laughs> we'll just have to go <laughs> back again, minute. and it's expensive. Yeah. Rogue Best is going to have things that nobody has ever seen. And in our world right now, there's almost nothing that nobody's ever seen. Exactly. He said he's been keeping it in like storage for decades. And it's like, I can't wait to see what he plucks out. It's going to be so cool. 
And in other news, we have two new album releases coming out. July 9th, Yellow Submarine is re-released in theaters. Oh, I want to go see it. I I think it's only showing like in a handful of places, at least here in L.A. You can find it. It's hard to find. Um, like it's at our Alamo Draft House here in Brooklyn. So, you know, it's sold out in three minutes. If you can find it, you can reserve your tickets now in advance if you still have any left. Anyway, I am a very big Beatles fan, but I will say I've never seen it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I don't know how it happened. I started being a Beatles fan at eight. It should have been the first thing I saw. I've never seen it. So I'm going to see it for the first time when it's re-released. That's so exciting. We're definitely going to talk about that because I am dying to know what your first impression is of Yellow Submarine. I saw it pretty early in my Beatles when I got introduced to the Beatles. I don't know if I should call it the soundtrack because the soundtrack I always think of is the white cover but the blue one with the submarine on the front is the one that was my first Beatles album ever. So yeah, it's part of my story, but I can't wait to, to talk to you about it once you've seen it. I hope I like it. Uh. Yeah, I know. And the, the weird Beatle voices. When I was a kid, I was like, oh, those are the Beatles. And now it's like, I listen, and it's like blatantly obvious. It's like, these people aren't even close to the Beatles. You know, I think that's why I didn't see it. Because I heard that it wasn't actually the Beatles. So I was like, okay, if it's not really the Beatles, I don't need to see this. It's worth a viewing, especially in the theater. That'll be really cool. I still haven't gotten tickets, but I'll find a way. And then the second album that's coming out is the White Album. We're going to have a 50th anniversary remix remaster in November, coinciding with the actual 50th anniversary. And we hope, we think, it's going to be once again work done by Giles Martin, who created that absolutely astounding Sgt. Pepper last year. <sighs> Yeah, remember that? Oh, it's so amazing. Oh, if it's anything like that, Sgt. Pepper set, it's like listening to it for the first time. And there's so many moments on the White Album that will benefit from that so much. Oh, it's gonna be so good. We should post our link. Last year when it came out, Rebeat wrote a track by track analysis of it. Yes, we'll post that in the episode guide on Rebeat. It's every track. Oh, now I want to go listen to it like all day. Yay! <laughs> This week in Beatles history, big week, because July 6th, 1957, a very fateful day, John Lennon meets Paul McCartney at the Walton Parish Church Garden Fate. As the story goes, John and his band, the Quarrymen, were obviously playing at the Fate. If you believe the amazing TV movie In His Life with John Lennon story from the year 2000, my fave, <laughs> Paul rides on a little bicycle sees John forgetting all the words, his guitar is not really tuned, and he's sort of like, he's very charismatic, and that sort of impressed Paul. So afterwards, of course, John meets Paul. Paul immediately tunes John's guitar, as one does, and plays a little something, impresses John back, and they're very taken with each other. And two weeks later, apparently, John invites Paul to join the quarrymen, and... The rest is history, I suppose. My favorite account of this is in Mark Lewison's Tune In, The Beatles All Those Years, his volume one of three, wonderful biographical tome of the Beatles. And he's a god in the Beatles geek world. We love you, Mark Lewison. What he points out is that the Beatles had some mutual friends. So Ivan Vaughn was a friend of both John and Paul. Mm hmm. John was playing at the Fate, and Ivan thought Paul would be interested, so he brought his two years younger friend along. John never would have met Paul because they were at different schools at the time. And of course, when you're 15 and 17, it's a big difference in yeah, age and totally. maturity. Paul was really impressed with John because he was singing the song, Come and Go With Me, and he didn't really know all the words. He was kind of ad-libbing, and he was saying, Come and Go With Me, down to the penitentiary. <laughs> so he was typical John and Paul thought that was really funny and then they went back behind the church and as you said Paul took John's guitar turned it upside down because he's a lefty tuned it and sang Eddie Cochran's 20 Flight Rock which was one of those songs that everybody was trying to do and nobody could pull off which is also in the John Lennon story in his life the John Lennon story just saying I'm just going to keep shouting out that terrible biopic yeah, terrible. I mean, amazing. And then the next thing he did, and I put Paul in my band if he did this, he went over to a piano and he did Long Tall Sally. Which obviously would become part of the Beatles repertoire a few years later. All the little details make it such a cool and compelling story. If the pieces didn't fall into place exactly as they sort of did. 
And you know what else is amazing is that they actually got pictures of not only the quarry men on that truck, but the quarry men playing. And I think somebody even got a very, very small recording. Is that right? I think you are right. Definitely there are pictures. In fact, I think hanging back to March at the New York, New Jersey Fest for Beatles fans, I think the person who took the photos was there. Yes, you're right. You're right. He was. Yeah. But yeah, he was definitely there. There may be a recording. I'm not sure. I don't think I've ever heard it. I think I might have. The fact that we have pictures is pretty amazing for a random high school band playing at the Summer Church Festival. Nobody takes pictures of that. No, especially, you know, in an era before smartphones and digital cameras even. Why waste film on like this little kitty band performing at a church? Like, who's going to remember that? But thank God, you know, somebody had the wherewithal to like take a couple snapshots. July 6th, the start of everything. And then the next bit of Beatles history happened the next day, but in 1940, when our beloved drummer Ringo Starr was born. He turned 78 years old this year. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe that. That's like, in two years, he'll be 80. Like, if you put it in that context, it's like, damn. He still looks good. He is still performing. He is still very physically fit. He is a vegetarian. He takes care of himself. So rock on, Ringo. Peace and love. Keep it going. If you want to celebrate Ringo's birthday, there is a worldwide peace and love event on his birthday, everywhere from Tokyo to Russia to Germany to Brazil to many, many cities in the USA are joining in. So at Hard Rock Cafes around the world on July 7th, it's on Ringo's Facebook page under events and join your fellow Beatles fans in saying happy birthday to Ringo. But the reason we're all here is to talk not about Ringo, but about Paul, because Paul has been a little busy. He's been a little busy lately. Paul has been messing with our emotions for the entire month of June. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to discuss everything that he's been doing. We need to talk about the album. We need to talk about the new songs because it's the first album we've had since 2013 with new. And it's very exciting to finally get some new Paul music. I know. I'm so excited. And the thing, too, from my perspective, 2013, when New came out, I was kind of like off the Beatles. Like, I know that sounds crazy, but I was sort of like, I even wrote an article for Pop Dose called Why I Quit the Beatles, because I just, I don't know, I sort of had hit like an echelon where I just was not feeling it. So I wasn't even like around for the new stuff, which I love. I know. I love that album. Like, I really, really, that's like, oh, it's so good. I listen to it constantly. So it's like, for me, I wish I could have been around for the hype because it had such a great, like, rollout. But so this is doubly exciting because now I'm not on my Beatles sabbatical. <laughs> Yay! So for this new album, rumors were circulating for a while. We thought it was going to come out sometime last summer. We had this fake name and it just never happened. Um, we knew he was recording it last year. It was in Hollywood. Ringo was even recording with him. He was at what is now the Henson Studio, which was the old A&M Records, which actually that's where George met Olivia um, here in Hollywood on La Brea. But yeah, he had been kind of hanging out there. And I know that he and Ringo did that really shitty song. Sorry, guys. Um, last year for Ringo's dumb album. It's terrible. I, I can't lie. I just assume they were also working on Paul's, but I don't know if that's true. That's one of the rumors in this album that he's got all these collaborators. So we don't even know yet. Ringo could be on it. Lady Gaga could be on it. Beck could be on it. There's so many rumors about who's duetting with him in this album. It's weird. Who even knows? I hope it's not like a solid duet. But like if you look historically, he's always done. I mean, for the most part, I'm thinking about like Plenty Pie. There's a collab. The first big one is Michael Jackson and then Flowers in the Dirt with Elvis Costello. So he does these periods where he does that. The first inkling that we had for this new album was June 10th, which now seems like a long time because we've been sucked into this drama for so long. It's like exhausting. I woke up that morning and I think you well, we were definitely texting when mm-hmm. we noticed this, but Paul's social media just went white. Like they wiped out his Instagram account and it was causing a lot of stress to a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> like it was a very stressful situation. Nobody wants to say it, but we're going to say it. You don't know if maybe he died. We don't know what it is. We're just saying. Like, you thought it too? Of course I thought it too. Everybody thought it. That was my first thought. It's like, oh my God, where's Paul? 
And thank goodness that was the day that he was recording for Carpool Karaoke in Liverpool, because then we had some social images emerge of him and James Corden doing their thing. Pretty soon after the white image, he put this hand-drawn image of this pyramid, train thing, Illuminati symbol, who knew, some weird triangle with some circles. I was super in the Illuminati game. I was like, what's happening? I mean, I think we were even texting. It's like, I really hope that wasn't the album image because it's so, like, not amazing. Yeah. But it kind of made sense, though, because the anniversary of the White Album, it's like, okay, maybe it would have been a white cover. Oh, right. That's what everybody was thinking. Maybe the White Album was coming soon. That anniversary is until November, but it could happen. Yeah. But the carpool karaoke and the Philharmonic Pub in Liverpool and all those things gave us some clues about what was happening, especially because they released a YouTube video of a new song. Yeah. And I think some people were like streaming it live on Facebook. And so there was like inklings, but the best we got was just a tiny clip. So you couldn't really tell quality or how good the song was. Which kind of amazed me that that pub is so tiny, yet that recording was still so bad. And I don't mean bad like the music was bad. The recording was terrible. You could barely see it. There's big light in the corner. It's just very close to Paul McCartney, but the video was not good. It kind of made me think that was like a plant because like, I won't talk about the carpool karaoke segment, but in that scene, like when Paul's playing in the little pub, you know, you can see members of Paul's team. So one of the audience members who is acting super surprised, like almost overly so, was Paul's, I think it's his road manager, head of security, I think also. His name is Brian Riddle. Oh my God, that was Brian. I didn't even notice. Yeah, yeah. Brian Riddle was in the audience. We'll post an image of Brian, of, you know, him in this video, but he's in it a few times, like two different shots. And he's trying to act super excited. But anybody who's been to Paul shows or sort of like knows a little bit about who Paul tours with as far as like his staff, it's like, oh my gosh, Brian Riddle is in the audience. So my first thought with this video was like, is it a plant? Is it somebody from Paul's team who is leaking this intentionally? You're probably right because nobody else leaked it. And nobody had a phone. If you look at the audience shots in Carpool Karaoke, there weren't people filming this. Yeah, I really think it was like intentional, but it was good. I mean, it was a good buzzworthy tactic. Yeah, I was excited. I was playing it all day. Yeah, I know. We were trying to figure out like, what's he saying? Like, what's the title going to be? And then it was sort of rumor that it was going to be, it wasn't come on to me. It was like a different title, right? It's like coming to you. It was something that kind of sounded like come on to me, but nobody knew exactly what he was saying. Yeah, that was exciting. It was sort of like the beginning of knowing it was the new album coming. And then Paul kept putting out social media teasers, him in the studio and pictures of equipment with his name on a piece of tape. Nothing direct, but definitely more, more things to get us excited that something new is coming. And none of his other stuff was there still. It was still just five images on Instagram. I hate to even admit this. I think I tweeted this and I should have deleted it because I was so wrong. But I really (laughs) thought that he was going to just drop the album. I really thought we were going to wake up, have a new Paul album, because I think he would have probably taken a page out of like the Beyonce playbook if he had done that. But as we know, he didn't do that because, you know, spoiler, we have a release date, which we'll get to. Um, But yeah, but I I really thought that was going to happen. I did too. I was convinced that it was going to be the following Friday. I found some news article and it was totally wrong. And I was convinced that like you should get up at 3 a.m. because it's going to drop at the time (laughs) that it's going to be like everybody's going to be on that same date between L.A. and the U.K. Didn't happen. I know Erica was like, um, because I go to bed because I'm very old. I'm an old lady. I love to go to bed as early as possible, basically. So she, and she was convinced it was going to drop at what, like 9 a.m. London time. Yeah. So she was trying to get me to stay up till midnight my time, which doesn't sound like a big stretch, but I love to be in bed early. So I did and nothing happened and we were very sad. Yes. But what we did get were more clues to what we were going to get. So clues about the album title. And that was our whole weekend. We were just deciphering the pictures and we figured out station. And then I remember looking through a list of all of the stations in Liverpool. I wonder which one kind of fits with the text. Well, it was none of those. (laughs) No, it wasn't. It was something that we didn't even see coming. You texted me, I think, in the morning. You were researching the Liverpool stations and we were both Googling around. But then you discovered the painting that Paul had done in the 80s. My boyfriend, he was looking at online and he's like, he found this piece called Egypt Station that Paul McCartney painted in 1988. And that was like a revelation. So, you know, we figured it out. Like, I just, you know, I want to put that out there. Like, we were the ones. It was us. We did. We figured it out. Yeah. Yeah, we knew it. (laughs) (laughs) 
we got one thing right. And and about an hour great. before it, it came. I know. I know. <laughs> Could have maybe, you know, proceeded a little bit more. But I think like also there was some packaging that was being released. People were sort of posting these mocked up packages for the album release, which turned out to be fake even though people were like loving it and they were saying, Oh, it's on paulmccartney.com. It's not. Um, no, it's not. It was just sort of people taking the images this team had posted and making them into fake packages. That was the clue. Nothing was new on those things. Obviously we don't have Intel on the MPL team or the, you know, the release side, but I'm guessing that because there was all this kind of stuff leaking and all this fake information, fake news <laughs> going around. Um, I think I probably put pressure on them to like really just get on with the announcement because they announced, I think, the release like a day maybe after those like fake images, those photoshopped record packages were going around like on Reddit and stuff. They made a little video. It was like 30 seconds, I think, just revealing the album title. And then everything started coming bang, bang, bang. So they released the two tracks and then they released YouTube videos with the lyrics. And then at the end of that week was Paul appearing on Carpool Karaoke with James Corden. Oh, my God. Yeah. And how much did you love Carpool Karaoke? I mean, honestly, so amazing. Paul is too pure for this world. He's too good. He's too pure. He's, oh my God, so good. And like, I don't know about you, Erica, but like at this point in my life and in my Beatles fandom journey, ugh, this sounds awful, but you know, it's very hard for me to like tear up or like, you know, I feel like I've seen it all, you know, pretty much, but just seeing him back in Liverpool and like going back to Fourthland Road and the house and like telling the stories, it's like, and particularly when he said some really touching things about, you know, James Corden's grandfather and it, oh, just, I was just a mess. I was just a mess. It was that great. moment was so <laughs> sweet. And I'll admit, I didn't watch it for about three days after it came out because everybody in all of my feeds were saying how much they were crying and how emotional it was. Like, I don't know if I want this. <laughs> I don't know if I want to know what everybody's freaking out about. So right. I finally watched it in the middle of the night. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. And it was, it was beautiful. It was amazing. And you know, it was a little bit of a new Paul, you know, he has a little bit more gray in his hair. He's showing his age a little bit more. I think that surprised people as much as everybody gave him shit for dyeing his hair. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. it, I think seeing him go a little bit more natural, it was a small shock. I'll, I'll admit that, you know, he did look older than I have ever seen him look before. So I kind of feel like that made the whole trip a bit more poignant. For sure. I love Liverpool so much and to like see him there and like about 10 years ago I did the National Trust tour of Mendips and Paul's house and it was it's to see him back knowing that space I don't know it was just so beautiful it was you know it's almost like a homecoming and and the fact that he is like going gray a little bit which by the way awesome like this is what we wanted all along Paul going back to like the when he started to go gray in like the early 90s late 80s but that look was on point for sure I always wonder how many people actually knew about it I mean sure they had to set some of that up but it just was created in such a loving organic way it's, ugh, I love it yeah and the fun thing about watching this is that people like him they genuinely like him they're happy yeah. to see him a lot of celebrities just wouldn't get that kind of reception. They're welcoming him home. The, the, the bit with the hairdresser was so cute. Oh, yeah, she was so sweet. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think Paul himself has always just sort of seen himself as like a kid from Liverpool. I don't think he's ever lost that. So I imagine going home for him feels natural. And, you know, even though he's had obviously all the success, the way he talks about Liverpool, you can tell it still means so much to him. I can't even imagine what it would have been like to see your childhood home exactly as it was when you were 18 years old, yeah. preserved, and you just come back to this after, what, you know, 60 years almost? It was just surreal. I mean, you can just imagine what's going on in his head thinking about his mom and his dad and his brother and John. Yeah, yeah, and such a different point in his life before all the madness. And But I do, I might have to correct Paul because he said in the Carpool Karaoke that that was the first time he'd been back in 50 years. I don't think that's true. And don't like, don't at me on this, but I seem to remember that when he was married to Heather or when they were dating, he took her there. Because I feel like I thought about that when I went there. I was like, oh, Heather Mills has been here. Oh, really? So Ew. I think so. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll give this to Paul. He probably blacked it all out. Yeah, that's fair enough. Fair enough. I would like, too. Yeah, no hate. Like, 
you tell yourself what you need to survive, Paul, because, you know, that's a dark time for all of us. But, yeah. you know, we get it. We get it. That's OK. I loved <laughs> um, how one of the songs and by the way, I kind of wish they would have done more of a variety of songs. Like, I really wanted to see him like bust out into like Gold Digger. Cause you know, he knows like all the words. Mm-hmm. He loves Kanye. But I loved how James Corden knew all the words to come on to me. And it's like, you know, he was like obsessively listening to that, probably in the plane over trying to like remember everything oh, in totally. his little James Corden way. He was perfect. He was the perfect guide because he was both very excited, but also able to keep his shit together and be cool. He and Paul were comfortable together in the car. I probably would have been more like the Chris Farley sketch if that was <laughs> me leading home car yes. anywhere. He did a really good job and they were very open together and that let it be bit where he was crying and oh my god yeah paul oh. talked a little bit about spirituality which he never does no very that's very like out of character for paul but very cool it was just one little phrase about his grandfather still being there it changed the mood but in a very good way but it was it was stunning yeah that was where i was like tearing up and it was edited so well so there was like a beat after paul said that and it was the perfect moment uh, just so so good it was so much more than any other carpool karaoke, you know, obviously, because it's, it's Paul, I'm sure they want to do it right. But it, it was just so, so good. And then they went to the concert, which we saw some of that on the YouTube video. And then we got a little bit more on carpool <laughs> karaoke. And again, they just like him. They're just happy to see him. Paul, obviously, it's like he hometown boy does good. And they're very proud. I think I'm not sure why. We'll obviously talk more about Liverpool, you know, in future episodes, because it's such a huge part of the Beatles story. But it seems like Paul more than the others. And maybe it's just because he's still like actively making music and touring, you know, more than Ringo, certainly uh, more than John and George, certainly. Sorry. Too soon. Mm. Um, Always too soon. soon. (laughs) And he's also like super gregarious and, you know, of the people like when he's out and about, usually. Seeing him in Liverpool in his element playing to like a small pub, it's like, you know, you think about like when they came up and when the Beatles were playing those little pubs and, you know, around Liverpool and Matthew Street. And then even in London playing some small gigs in the early days, it's like kind of a return for him. I would give anything to be in a small group environment seeing Paul. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I know. It's so hard for him to get away with playing to less in a stadium now. But that must be the most surreal amazing experience. And I'll say Paul ages backwards about 25 years when he gets on stage. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about that as I was watching the Carpool Karaoke clip. I was like, I can't believe, and you, Erica, wrote an awesome article a few years ago for Rebeat about this, where it's Paul's really redefining what it means to not only be like a veteran musician, but also just what it means to age gracefully. And it's like, you think about his actual like numerical age. He just turned what, uh, 76, 76. And it's, yeah. And it's like, what the hell? Like how many other 76 year olds are doing that with his stamina, with his, you know, like bravado with his, like, you know, I mean, that's insane. I just think about just how he's totally changed game when it comes to like what you think of a 76 year old and what they can do. I think he has changed not even in the music world, but in our lives. If you look at how much people aged, even in Paul's time, you got married so young, you became an old man by 35, you settled down and you retired and you were so old before your time and look at him. And now people our age, nobody feels, I won't say nobody, but most people feel like you can do anything you want at any age. It's such a different mindset. And that's a really good point about like, you know, when he was growing up, people sort of sat back in their rocking chairs at maybe 55, 60, you know, thinking about the retirement age of 65 anyway, it's like, he's way past that, you know? Yeah. Well, even look at pictures of his own father who was much younger than he is now when you see those pictures. And he looks like a much older man than Paul. Keep doing what you love, I guess. Yeah. I think that's the moral of the story here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, age gracefully and don't dye your hair anymore. That's also the moral of the story for Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I hope other people like it. Uh, if you like Paul's gray hair, let us know. Tweet at us. Uh, we'll create a Twitter poll so we can find out for sure. And we'll let Paul know because Paul will definitely be listening to this. And um, yeah, he. I mean, he will find out of somehow. Of course he will. He knows he will. we'll like it. Yeah, exactly. We could probably talk about corporal karaoke forever. Yeah. I know I could. 
okay, let's figure out, like, what do we know about Egypt Station as an album? It's his 17th solo album. It's the first release on Capitol Records since Chaos and Creation in 2005. Oh, yeah, because he was on that Starbucks label. Before. Yeah, yeah, and then he was on something right? else in between. I don't remember what new was on, but it wasn't on that. It's cool that he's going home, and I'm wondering... I wonder what made him make that decision. I know that when he signed the Capitol, it was a big deal. It was just more than him producing a new album. Yeah. I think they get a lot of rights to a lot of things. Yeah, I know that, well, Universal, which owns Capitol now, like they have obviously the catalog, the Beatles catalog. Don't quote me, but I think it, they have all four Beatles solo catalogs. <laughs> the majority anyway, because some of them label hopped a lot. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting what made him go back to Capitol. But hey, that's fine. You know, it was weird. I mean, the whole thing with the Hear Music, the Starbucks label was bizarre. So this makes me more comfortable. And that's what's important, I guess. Well, this is Paul. He's always doing something new, right? He's always trying stuff. True. Yeah. He is the experimental beetle. Well, (laughs) said said loosely. Well, he was the first one to expose himself to avant-garde music and get interested in it. He was the first one to use a tape loop. Sometimes he's the most experimental beetle. I'm a shameless Paul McCartney apologist, though, so it's, it's, it's hard for me to make an argument where Paul is the best is not the thesis. <laughs> it's okay. I won't hold that against you um, <laughs> because I, I tend to be the same way. <laughs> so it's coming out September 7th of this year. Yeah. He teased us and teased us and teased us. And when he dropped oh. was a double A-side single of Come On To Me and a second song, I Don't Know which are now out digitally only or on YouTube in these lyric videos that they put out, which were actually kind of trippy and freaky. If you looked at them, the pieces of the Egypt Station album cover kind of move around in a weird sort of gelatinous way. It's very strange. Yeah, the ram is pretty weird. I mean, and we'll talk about Thrillington for a moment, mm-hmm. but there's a weird like ram head coincidence thing. I think it's a ram. Is that a ram on the cover of Egypt Station? I think so. It's hard to tell because it's also hand-drawn. It's funny because the morning that come on to me and I don't know dropped, I woke up and I immediately looked for them. And what I found on YouTube were these two really bizarre videos um, (laughs) that were sort of like, like tracks that had been cut off McCartney too, because they were too bad, if that's possible. Um, And they were just like, I don't even know. One of them was like plonking on a piano. Yeah, it was with, just like, somebody banging on piano keys. Yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> and I freaked out and I it was like texting Erica and I was like, oh my God, like if this is it, like I'm going to cry because like we've been waiting so long for this goddamn album that it's like if it were, was going to be like experimental bullshit, like I was going to throw my fucking like McCartney records out the window. Like I was just so upset, <laughs> so upset. Luckily, but, I was able to listen to it with a little more objectivity because I wasn't <laughs> crying so and then I just (laughs) noticed that you know we've already heard come on to me so this has to be a joke and it's total utter trash and so we got different songs which is good (laughs) yes oh my god yeah thank god thank god it was only about an hour or two gap between me freaking the fuck out and like actually getting to hear the the new track so all right I feel better but it was a scary it was like probably one of the most stressful parts of the very stressful album rollout. We'll post those somewhere in our social because they are actually hilarious. Yeah, yeah, we'll post them maybe in the with the the episode on Rebeat, so you can like just listen to them and just uh, only for like five seconds because they're they're bad. But yeah, so we did get this double single, which is great. What was your initial thought when you heard "Come On to Me"? Initially. As much of a Paul McCartney apologist as I am, I didn't love it. Um, I felt like it sounded oh, yeah. a lot like some of the lesser songs and some of his other albums. It reminded me a lot of I Can Bet from New. It mm-hmm. had kind of a similar a similar vibe. Actually, I felt like it was kind of the I Can Bet in the era of Me Too, because instead of what that song said was, you should just guess what I'm going to do to you later. This was... <laughs> If you come on to me, then I'll come on to you. And he was basically asking for consent to come over. You know, there was one line in it that says, I don't think I can wait like I'm supposed to do. And I was like, okay, that sounds kind of rapey. But then it was followed by, (laughs) how soon can we arrange a formal introduction? Then I was like, oh, my God, this is like Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stuff. Oh, my gosh. It like veers (laughs) into like a royal 
<laughs> of royal territory. It's so um, proper and British. It's so cute. Yeah, it's so fun. Yeah, and you're so right. It is kind of like definitely you can compare it to I Can Bet, which I fucking love I Can Bet. I've had that stuck in my head for like two weeks. Um, and I'm not sorry about that. But mm-hmm. yeah, I totally get it. Um, I think, I don't know, when I heard it I guess I wasn't even paying attention that much to the lyrics but I sort of just like took it as like a like a big picture sort of overview of it and my thought was like okay well he's obviously creating something he could play live and that people will be into with the chorus it's kind of like beep 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 yeah mm-hmm. where it's like do 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 or whatever the hell it is um I clearly don't know the song as well as James Corden does um mm-hmm. you know there's a couple of callback verses or choruses that he I don't know he just chucked them in there I feel like the song kind of veers all over the place for me and it's nothing like super remarkable like I wouldn't include it on any of my like top Paul song playlists but it's fine <laughs> It's going to be fun in concert. You know what? It gets better. The last third is actually really good because he brings in some weird kind of 70s sounding brass instruments. And then he starts True. scream singing kind of like Monkberry Moon Delight Paul all of a sudden. Yeah. So once he gets to that part where everything comes together at the end, it's really cool. But in the beginning, I was kind of like, I waited five years for a new album. And this feels like kind of a lack of imagination in both lyrics and music. But it does get better. Yeah, no, I agree. Definitely my emotions kind of veered where yours did too. But I actually kind of like, I don't know better. I like that classic Paul sort of sound. And honestly, I don't know, reminds me of Driving Rain. (laughs) And I'm not mad about that because, you know, I love me some Driving Rain. Fucking love Driving Rain. I thought of it as like... Phil Collins mid 80s sort of chorus you know from a lover to a friend yeah it was it was definitely that yeah yeah he does that so well he knows how to do that schmaltzy kind of ballady song that you just I mean I don't hate it it's kind of cheesy it's kind of whatever but I, I like it I like that I love sad melancholy Paul of the piano yeah and some of the lyrics are really good it starts out crows at my windows dogs at my door I don't think I can take anymore like that's really good Ugh. That's yeah, a great so lyric. Good. Yeah. And I don't know if it's like stuff that I'm working through right now, but I like super relate to it. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't know either. Like I, <laughs> you know, with the chorus, the lyrics, obviously compared to like, come on to me, I think, or head and tails above. I think they did a good job with, even though it's a double A side releasing come on to me first, because mm-hmm. this is actually a better song, I think. So we get used to come on to me and then we hear this one, which comes second, but it feels like it's a better song to me. So they kind of balance each other out now that I'm hearing both of them. So double A side. Yeah, it's more substantial, definitely. But I'm excited to hear them in context with the album because like obviously, you know, I think as a collection and obviously like, you know, the music industry, we don't really consume albums the same way as we used to. But I still kind of like to contextualize everything. So how do these songs fit into the album? Like, what's the story? Maybe we'll get another track, I don't know, before the album drops, but I'm just excited to hear it with everything else. PaulMcCartney.com released a little blurb about what it was, and they're saying that it has 14 songs combined to create a unique travelogue vibe. I don't, what does that mean? Like, I don't... <laughs> I think what it means is that he's trying to capture a different <laughs> That's interesting. place or location... <laughs> That could have been visited with every song, though I don't know how the two songs that we heard fit into that because they didn't. Yeah. But we will we will find out later. Um, But it does sound like there's some good things coming. An acoustic meditation on present day contentedness, a timeless anthem that would fit on virtually any album of any McCartney era called People Want Peace. I'm a little nervous about that. That's a really kind of loaded thing to say. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that's one of the things that we'll probably unpack. Yeah. In the future. Yeah. And then a song that they're saying is kind of like Band on the Run or like the second side of Abbey Road, a song sweet structure hearkening back to the days of Paul's previous combos. That could be really good. He's done like connected tracks and like secret tracks, but I don't think, I can't think of anything that he's done sort of like that recently. So that'll be good. I'm excited for September. I don't feel like he's going to release anything else because he's so, I don't know, he's regimented it. Now that he said it's September, I don't feel like he's going to come and be like, hey, it's me again. It's funny because we're recording this on, uh, what is this, June 29th? Mm -hmm. And this morning, Paul posted something on his Instagram story. And it was like, it seemed for a second like he dropped another song. And I was like, oh, I can't take this. But it was just a link to uh, listen to Come On To Me. (laughs) 
<laughs> for a second I was like, oh, and I knew we were recording and I'm like, oh, we got to like rearrange this whole thing. We need to absorb this. Also, that's what he did for New. He put out the song New, I think, in July, just like now, June, July. And then the album itself didn't come out until October. Mm, yeah, that makes sense then. Okay, so just as we were about to post this podcast, call it done, move on. Paul McCartney surprised us once again because he announced the first date of what it's called, wait for it, the Freshen Up Tour. What? I can't deal with this. <laughs> can't Why? Deal with this. What the fuck? I don't know. Like, Freshen Up. It's like, is Mentos sponsoring this? Or like, toothpaste? Like, I, I don't know. It Freshen Up. Freshen Up was that gross gum in the 80s with the minty, gelatinous center, this like yucky Ew. thing in the middle. Yeah, I remember it. I remember it. it was gross. And there are all these commercials you can find on YouTube, which we'll have to post because from now on, sorry, Paul, we're trolling you for this. So trolling. I'm going to have to look at every bodega in New York City now because I want fresh up gum. Well, you know some bodegas got it because they've got stock from the 80s in the back room. I am just praying that's not a track name no <laughs> for kidding. each of station. What does it yeah. even mean, freshen up? Like, out there was like, we're getting out there. One-on-one -on -one was like, we're making it intimate, even though they were in stadiums, whatever. But right. what is what is this? Is this a, a, a dental hygiene crusade? I mean, what could possibly be the, yeah, the meaning I, behind this? Is he refreshing the set list? That would be amazing. Like, if he were just going to play, like, deep tracks, that would be fun but that's not happening <laughs> no freshen up for him probably means put in those two songs that were released in the place of new and queenie eye and there we go no oh my gosh don't take them out paul i know on, i love add... them but you know how uh. he is he never veers from the set list and he switches those new things out in 2009 it was memory almost full then he switched it to new and now he's going to switch it to that i would love no. to still be hearing mama only knows Oh my God, me too. I love that song. Oh, and you know what? I would not be mad at like English tea because I like that in his set. That was cute. In I did too. It was yeah. great. Little chaos. Paul, please take out. I swear to God, if I have to sit through him doing like magical mystery tour one more time, I'm going to lose my shit. Don't need to hear that. We don't need I mean, to hear all together now. It's it's cute. No. Oh come my on. God. Take that shit out. Good news for you, Canada folks. Quebec City and Montreal and Winnipeg and Edmonton. So making his way across Canada. And that's all like mid to late September. Yeah. So, so the week after the album comes out. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that means that through the end of the year, we're going to get U.S. tour dates and hopefully the rest of the world, too. I just yeah, he um, is definitely going to roll out more. When we least expect it, if you want to get tickets to these four shows, um, they go on sale July 13th. So good luck. Tickets for Paul shows are always kind of a shit show to get them. But. Yeah, let us know if you have any success getting them, if you had any fun getting them, if you got any really good seats. But hit us up on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Yeah, let us know where you're sitting, where you, like what you're looking forward to. Um, it's hard to say, you know, what we're going to hear from the new album although we're assuming the first two tracks who knows maybe there'll be something else amazing he'll add on to the set list so looking at what he did and what he put us through and what he probably put everybody through who loves him this week it's not new for him to be weird no. with his marketing. No, Paul is super weird. Paul is, has always been into those like clever ploys to sort of hook you in and keep you talking. Like obviously we're still talking, it's all over and we're still talking about what the rollout has been for Egypt Station. And it's, yeah, it's not anything new. It goes back to the Beatles. It goes back to Paul is dead. You know, that was really the first, and I'm not saying the Beatles were involved in like perpetuating that or like even generating that concept, but they definitely didn't hate it. You know, I think they've used it over the years in various ways to sort of engage people or to just to keep people talking. Like, is he dead? Is he not dead? And it's funny because... <laughs> Our very first article that we ever published on Reveat was an article about Paul is Dead. And I swear to God, that's still our number one most popular article of that's all time. That's crazy. Yeah, it's insane. So, I mean, that debate is still going. That's like free publicity or free, you know, word of mouth. It's insane. 
I can't believe people even still think that, but it's funny that they do. Go read the comments section of that article. It's fantastic. We'll link the article in this episode also on Rebeat, so you can read it and we'll post it elsewhere. But yeah, it's hysterical. The comments are just insane. I think one thing Paul's always had is kind of a sense of theatricality. He always likes pseudonyms. Sgt. Pepper was all about putting on a completely different persona as a different band to create something different. He did the Firemen. He did this Percy Thrillington thing, which is very interesting. And he likes to do secret things like the secret code that was embedded in the back in the US tour DVD that unlocked access to a very, very 2002 30 minute concert. (laughs) Yeah. You know, what's so funny. I have that DVD. I did not know about that. So when I go home tonight, I'm going to look at my DVD. Oh, no, you've got to find the code. I know I've got to find my code like and go to the secret website. I'm sure it's still there. It's only uh, 16 years ago. But it's super cutting edge because it was the first time in history that both PC and Apple users would be able to connect to the same content. He worked with Steve Jobs to make this a thing. That's insane. Yeah. That's amazing. See, Paul is the experimental beetle. He's like on the front line of all this shit. And this is totally not a secret thing he did. But remember his watch that could take pictures and that's how, you know, driving ring got his cover. And yes. like, he and Heather had those watches. And then I begged my mom to get me one and she did for Christmas. And that was my only Christmas gift. But I fucking love that watch. Was it awesome? It was okay. It was okay. It was very of its time, but it was ahead of its time too. But yeah, like that's, that's super like technologically advanced for 2002. When New was released, I remember he just posted a series of really, really cryptic one or two word tweets every once in a while for like two weeks. So it was kind of like what he did on Instagram this Mm -hmm. time. And it was like, what the fuck is this? Oh my God. Like, has he gone senile? Is he dead? Is he doing a new (laughs) album? Like, what the fuck is happening? (laughs) (laughs) It's like the same thing. Oh, my God. Yeah. And in the end, they all connected to be part of a verse anew. So, you know, you just were following the clues for a while. And then he yeah. did he did some other weird things too. Like he drove a bus into Times Square for an impromptu performance of New and I think Queenie Eye. The cops kicked him out of Times Square. That's amazing. <laughs> I had forgotten about that. But yeah, I mean, I remember his weird pop-up secret performances for Memory Most Full too, because he did Amoeba Secret, which, you know, then there was the sort of official bootleg album that came out. That's right. Weren't you there? Uh, well, I was at the Highline Ballroom in New York show. I slept uh, on the street and it was worth it. Hundred percent. Oh my god! <laughs> I bet. Tiny, tiny venue. It was amazing. One of my favorite weird marketing techniques is what he did with the Thrillington album from 1977, oh and. Most people probably haven't heard of the Thrillington album. It was it was very weird. It was kind of rare, but it was just re-released. Yeah, it was re-released on colored vinyl, even. Nice. And what it was, what it is, is a big band instrumental version of Ram. Yeah. I love it. It grows on me. I mean, I think some of it sounds like elevator, like cheese music, but I really like some of the treatments. I think they suit the songs very well. They do. They do. Dear Boy is really cool. Yeah. They do all the harmonies. Monkberry Moon Delight is very awesome. Ram yeah. On is actually great. So there are some really good songs. So that was Thrillington. It's weird. It's cool. It's unusual. Now a lot of people do big band. A lot of people do jazz albums. That was not normal for mid-70s. No, for sure. And it was actually recorded around the time of Ram, too. It was recorded earlier. So they are sort of contemporaries, which is very strange if you think about it, because Ram is such like a, I think of it as almost like an acoustic, because it's besides like, obviously, Monkberry Moon Delight, you know, you can see Paul like sort of coming up with it and recording it in like Scotland or, you know, with Linda and that kind of thing. And then Thrillington is just a whole whole different story. For some reason, he wanted to do this. So he talked to an orchestrator that he knew who worked with Apple. He worked with Mary Hopkin on Those for the Days, kind of involved with McCartney and just asked him if he would do this. They recorded it with some of the top session players and orchestras in England in three days. And then they put it away for six years and didn't do anything. As you do. As you do. And then Paul was bored. So he decided to bring back Percy Thrillington, the fake orchestra leader who was so in love with the album Ram that he was compelled to create a big band version of it. But what he did was weird. 
because instead of publicizing the album, he publicized the character of Percy Thrillington. He wanted to create this crazy Victorian fop kind of character. He's like a dandy. Yeah, like a socialite. His first idea was to find somebody that nobody could trace because it was 1977 and you can't dox anybody in 1977 and dress him up in aristocratic clothing and photograph him as the enigmatic Percy Thrillington. So he did it. He went out to Ireland and he found a guy in the field and he asked him if he would do some photography, some modeling for him. He dressed him up in a, in a tux. And then he decided he didn't really look enough like what he thought Percy Thrillington could look like. So he trashed the photos. We'll post a photo of Percy Thrillington, quote unquote, on our Instagram. But what's so funny to me is like this person that he photographed doesn't even look old enough. No. Like he looks like a kid, right? When I think of what big band leaders should look like, it's like Lawrence Welk. It's not like this child who's like working in a field in Ireland. Paul was right to not use him. I don't know why he picked him in the first place. I mean, this guy was very, very clearly like a 16 year old farmhand. Yeah. Anyway, so on to the next idea. He had this very strange idea that he would start putting classified ads about Percy Thrillington's coming and going in the newspaper, the London Evening Standard. And a lot of people would read the classifieds because they didn't have phones. They would be commuting on the train or whatever, and they would read these newspapers from cover to cover, including these ads. And so he just put some very strange things. One of them was Percy Thrillington, despite excesses on both social and business time, hopes to lend his support to today's daffodil ball. That's it. (laughs) I love these clips so much. They just crack me up. There were many of them and people started getting interested once they saw three, four, five of these ads. One reporter even wrote an article, which you can see on the paulmccartney.com site called The Preambulations of Percy Thrillington. So it's basically just saying there's this guy, he's posting in these classified ads. We don't know who he is, but this is kind of interesting. So, you know... He's around, and it concluded with Percy Thrillington is alive and well and living in the country, but he has been gadding about somewhat, hence the frequent messages in the Evening Standard. So people started believing that this man existed, and and it went on and on. How long did it go on for? I think it was a couple of months. I mean, long enough for people to start recognizing that this character existed. One characteristic about Percy Thrillington was that he was kind of a horn dog. Oh, yeah, Paul. There was a rumor that he sent a single red rose to every female member of London's press on Valentine's Day, 1977. His assistant, he also had an assistant, Miss Telfer Smollett, had been interviewed on the radio saying that her boss wasn't married, but was most certainly an appreciator of women. So he was definitely like a, a Victorian dandy. And definitely not a confirmed bachelor, if you know what I mean. Yep. <laughs> he was out and about. He was in town. And so... What happened was some readers started getting in on the joke. They started placing equally weird advertisements in the classified ads in response to Percy Thrillington. So they wanted to know who he was, or they thought it was a funny game, but they did not know who he was. They didn't think he was Paul McCartney. One of the examples is, Dear Percy, as a fellow peripatetic traveler, I found the overwhelming need to join a top hole association called St. Christopher. Those good old fellows are most frightfully generous with old readies if a chap has the fearful misfortune to be deprived of his license. What? Oh my gosh, that's so confusing. Like it's, I just, I I don't know what any of that means. And I'm, I consider myself kind of smart, but like that's all these Victorian like isms are pretty, yeah. It's very weird. This was 1977. But what happened was Percy did not engage. Instead, he started interspersing his comings and goings in society with advertisements for the Thrillington album. I wonder if people were like pissed when they found out it was sort of just a marketing, (laughs) a marketing thing. Like, can't we have anything nice? It's just fun. Like Percy Thrillington? No, it's just got to be a selling album. Just to make sure that people weren't jaded, Paul threw in an accident. Percy Thrillington's condition is causing grave concern following injuries sustained at Newmarket in a gallant attempt to pluck his latest single, Admiral Halsey, from beneath the thundering hooves of runners in the 330 number grapes by request. Oh my goodness. So poor Percy, he got an accident trying to save his beloved big band version of a Paul McCartney song. Well, that makes (laughs) sense. I mean... 
I don't know. At that moment, I would be like, this is Paul McCartney. Like, I don't know. Like, I maybe maybe I wouldn't. I don't know. When I listen to that and he's doing Ram, I say that is Paul. If I didn't know what this was, I would say, is that a Paul McCartney thing? Yeah. Of course, this was like pre all the weird shit that Paul did later. Like, obviously pre McCartney too. Even like pre Fireman. Now we're so used to Paul's hijinks. I think right away we'd be like, good one, Paul. Like, we see you. Yeah. Um, but this is so early on that, yeah, it might have been just easier to like fool the public. But people really didn't know. The guy who wrote that article about Percy Thrillington actually started trying to track him down. So he mm. went to the advertising agency where these classified ads are being inputted and that led him to MPL, Paul McCartney's production company. But they told him Thrillington just liked to keep in touch. He was a friend. Gosh, it feels like so many people were in on it to right. keep it quiet. Not to mention there were probably 20 musicians who recorded the thing. Right. Did he pay them off? Like, I don't know how he got them to, like, just keep their mouths shut and not spill the secret. I mean, for years, for a long time. One reporter for a London publication claims he got hold of Percy Thrillington on the telephone once and asked him if he was really Paul McCartney. The writer says the answer was either ba or ba. <laughs> okay. Percy, if we're to believe, the album cover uh, is a ram, so... That makes sense. Yeah, or he just likes to walk around wearing a very creepy kind of steampunk ram's head. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. He is. He's a steampunk ram. That makes so much sense. We got to repost the thing from his Instagram when they were re-releasing Thrillington. There was this this little... With the weird ram head? Oh, this gif of the ram head moving around. It's freaky. <laughs> Yeah, we'll repost that on our Instagram because yeah. it's, it's really creepy. So the truth didn't finally come out until 1992. That's insane. The album didn't do well. It kind of disappeared into obscurity. It you know, went out of print and people kind of forgot about the comings and goings of Percy Thrillington after a while. Paul McCartney said, it was one of our madcap publicity schemes as if we were managing this character called Percy Thrillington. Now it was really just an excuse to do a big band album. Now the truth finally comes out. So he admitted it in 1992. It's a weird long game that he played for marketing a very obscure album that very few people ever heard. Yeah. And it makes you think of like what it was his goal anyway with Thrillington because it it probably would have sold a lot had it been Paul. You think of like Paul's classical works, like they sell because they're Paul. Like mm -hmm. I, I like classical music, but I would never like go out of my way to buy an album. And I, you know, of course I bought Paul's. So it's like people probably would have bought it and, you know, a big band album by Paul McCartney. But I think he just sort of wanted to have a big joke or just to do something to like liven up some album marketing. I, I don't know. I think he has fun with this stuff. I also think that he sometimes needs some kind of cover to do something new or different, put right. himself out there like in a the different way. Fireman, Sergeant Pepper. I mean, he, he does this a lot, even yeah. dating back to Paul Ramon in the early days. And this was not a common thing to do. Again, Paul McCartney liked it, and it was in his granny music in the Beatles. It was when he scored that album the family way um mm -hmm. 1967 i think and then it kind of just went through his career up to um kisses on the bottom in 2012 he likes this kind of music but it was not in vogue at that time oh no definitely not and it's also you know a call back to his father i mean he's been doing that kind of stuff for a long time like one of my favorite kind of Paul's granny music slash big band is Walking in the Park with Eloise, which oh, I love was a Jim McCartney song, you know, so mm -hmm. it's cool that Paul has such an affinity for that. And it, this is one of the albums that if you like Paul's dive into the big band, you'll love this album. This, it's good listening. It's a fun reworking of Ram, which is a really popular and beloved album. That was another thing. People didn't really like Ram when it came out. Now everybody loves Ram. Just crazy. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Me too. I think it might be my favorite McCartney solo album. So who was going to buy a big band version of that? In 1971 or 1977. Yeah, that's true. If they didn't like the original, like, shit, they wouldn't have liked this. But nowadays, it's wonderful. And yeah. it's done well. That's another thing. It's not some pop star's half-assed foray into some different genre. It's really good. It's done by top-notch musicians. Paul didn't arrange it. You know, an actual professional classical arranger arranged it. So it's very musical. It's musically deep. It's fun. So one of those little gems, you know, when you uncover them, it adds some depth and color into not just Paul's catalog, but just his story as like an artist. It's great. And that's one of the things that I just love about him, that he's not afraid to put something out there, whether it's under, you know, calling himself Percy Thrillington or the Fireman or Paul McCartney. And sometimes it's shit, but sometimes it's <laughs> sometimes, brilliant, yeah. you know, like he just puts out what he's thinking 
And it's kind of up to us to decide whether we think it's, it's wonderful or not. But that yeah. makes such an eclectic and multi-layered catalog that I can't think of any other artist who compares in that way. No, definitely not. He's not afraid to be divisive and polarizing. Obviously, it's like, you know, McCartney too. People can debate that for days and hours, you know, which is mm-hmm. a prime example. But Paul, I'm sure he doesn't care. It's like just a, a part of his genesis as a musician. Our final segment of the night is our favorite Beatle-related thing of the week. And this isn't a new thing. This is just something that maybe we're obsessed with right now or maybe we've been obsessed with in the past. So my favorite Beatle-related thing of the week is Paul-related since we're so Paul-centric right now. It's a song called Love Take Me Down to the Streets. It was written for the movie Role Models in 2008. That was a Paul Rudd movie. And it was performed by Joey Curatolo, who has been playing Paul in the Rain tribute for way longer than the Beatles were oh, ever yeah. together. He's, That's so, yeah. he's great. He's perfect. There's a running joke in this movie where they keep referencing this wing song they're calling Love Take Me Down to the Street. And one guy even plays it. And Paul Rudd's character consistently says that is not a wing song. I forgot about that joke. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. They do it a couple of times. And then at the end of the movie... During the credits, this song starts playing. And just watching the movie, I'm like, what the fuck? I've never heard this Paul McCartney song before. Because they got it so right. The way he sings it, the different beats in the song, kind of a band on the run sort of thing, the female harmony that sounds like Linda. The only catch is that the song is actually about going down to the street to get yourself a whore. (laughs) What, that's not a wings thing? Come on. like to eat at home you know that oh yeah yeah that's uh also very dirty anyway that's so cool do you know who wrote it i don't remember the names but it was the guys that wrote the movie so they were also songwriters they loved wings they put this joke in and in fact they did a second movie which is sort of in the same universe kind of a sequel called wanderlust and there is a scene where a bunch of hippies are sitting in a circle singing love take me down to the streets little extra reward if you liked the movie, the first movie. That's awesome. Yeah, I I do like that movie. I'll have to check out Wonderlust. I collect 60s teen magazines. So I have almost a full run of like Tiger Beat and 16. And so the other night I was looking through a teen date book from March 1968. And there was a story in there written by a fan. Her name is Leslie. I think her last name is San Angelo. And she was 17 years old and she was going to London from America. I think the sole purpose was to meet the Beatles. And so she wrote this series of articles for Team Datebook about going to their houses. And I was reading through her account of going to meet George. And I just thought it was so cute. And the fact that she showed up at his house with like a sack of shit from her fan club, letters and like gifts. Yeah. And he was like... I forget what he was doing. I think he was like in a swimsuit or something. And he came out from behind the house and was just sort of like, hey, what's up? Like very casual. Oh, my God. And they started chatting. Yeah. And then he was like, well, he's like, I kind of want to get changed. So do you guys mind coming into the house and having like a cup of tea while I get changed? It's like, ugh, geez, no, like, yeah, of course, like, we'll do that. So they go into the house and they meet Patty. She's there. Um, and, you know, they're chatting and stuff. And they're talking about the house and how it was like painted like crazy. And they're talking about just like sitting there with George. And he sort of didn't understand what all the fuss was about with all these gifts. And it's just a really sweet sweet story but I got curious I was looking up about this girl and like her story because I don't think I own the issue where she goes to Paul's house and I didn't realize this was the same girl but a few years ago um, and I'm a huge fan of Antiques Roadshow whatever it's the best there was a audio recording that came up for auction of Paul in his garden at his house reading one of John Lennon's poems from In His Own Right oh my god Uh, yeah completely never heard before. And he's also talking about other things and just sort of like, it's just a recorded conversation. And I think it was valued between like three and $5,000 at auction, but it was done by this girl, this girl, Leslie. So she showed up at Paul's house with her sack of stuff from the fan club and they just sat in the back garden and she asked Paul if she could record their conversation. He said, yes. And the rest is history. And now she's got this unheard recording. Um, I don't know if it's sold. This was, I think 2012 that she got the thing appraised. Um, and she also had the copy 
of, in his own right, that Paul's holding in a photograph that she took making the recording. So it's amazing. It's That's so incredible. Cool. Yeah. So it's a great story, but also I just love that she was a fan and she got to like spend that time with the Beatles. It's interesting to think, and I was thinking about this the other night when I was reading an article, you know, we tend to put the Beatles on a pedestal and think of them as like untouchable and stuff. But like back in the sixties, they were a band like everybody else. They were great rivals with like the Dave Clark five. People forget about that, which we'll talk about, I'm sure in a future episode, but like they were a band, they were in these team eggs. They were obviously idols to these girls, but you know, I don't know that if you turned up to like Mick Jagger's house, he'd invite you in, but the Beatles always did going back to like their parents. Yeah. And going all the way up to the Apple scruffs. Yeah, exactly. So they've always had this sort of thing. But I just, yeah, it was just a really sweet story. It made me happy. So that's my Beatles thing for the week. Um, yeah. So that concludes our very first episode. This has been so much fun talking about Egypt Station. And make sure you're following Paul McCartney on all his socials. If you aren't already, I'm sure if you're listening to this, you do. Uh, but make sure to follow us on our socials. We're at BC The Beatles. It's because the Beatles, but it's BC The Beatles on Instagram, Twitter, and we'll be on Facebook. And we will be posting every everything we've talked about in this episode on rebeatmag.com, R-E-B-E-A-T mag.com. And our website is coming soon. So stay tuned for that. And we will see you next time on Because the Beatles. Bye.